Hello and welcome to a summary of all you need to know about Out Out, the poem by Robert Frost. Now I'll explain the meaning related to this poem as well as language techniques and contextual factors that you need to be aware of if you are analysing this poem as part of your exams or coursework. So let's get started. Now, as I mentioned, Robert Frost authored Out Out, and essentially this poem is about a New England community. Now, do you remember contextually that Robert Frost himself, his ancestors were actually originally New Englanders, so a lot of his work has focused on the New England community, including this poem. So let's begin by reading part of this stanza, because it's only one whole stanza, and then we'll talk about techniques that you need to be aware of, and then we'll read the remaining stanza and also analyse that too. The bus saw snarled and rattled in the yard, and made dust and dropped stove-led sticks of wood, sweet-scented stuff when the breeze drew across it. And from there, those that lifted eyes could count five mountain ranges one behind the other under the sunset far into Vermont. As the snor- saw snarled and rattled, snarled and rattled, as it ran light, or had to bear a load, and nothing happened, day was all but done. Call it a day. I wish they might have said to please the boy by giving him the half hour that a boy counts so much when saved from work. His sister stood beside them in her apron to tell them supper. At the wall, Ed, the saw, as if to prove saws knew what supper meant, leaped out at the boy's hand, or seemed to leap. He must have given the hand. However, it was neither refused the meeting, but the hand. The boy's first outcry was a rueful laugh, and then he swung toward them, holding up the hand. Now, this part of the stanza essentially focuses on the New England community initially and then, of course, narrows our focus down to the boy who's been working and then we learn of a horrific cut that he received his hand. Now, the poem begins, Buzz Saw, and the focus on the Buzz Saw really reveals the crude and primitive agricultural tools that this New England community are using. Furthermore, it snarled and rattled, and essentially this onomatopoeia is quite animalistic. It has really acoustic effects, and it shows that the saw is almost possessed by devilish spirits. Of course, already from the start, there's this sense of foreboding that's created within us. We realise that this is a very dangerous object. Furthermore, the alliteration dust and dropped really shows just how violent the saw is as it's cutting this wood, and it's cutting, of course, these trees. Moreover, the sibilance, sweet scented stuff to describe the breeze that drew across it and carried the smell of the uh, wood essentially is an interesting contrast with the saw. Now, essentially, Frost mixes in the imagery of this really violent saw with actually a very rural, utopic idea of this New England community. So there's the sibilant, sweet-scented stuff and the breeze which drew across it. So this is symbolic of a rural utopia. Furthermore, the alliteration and the enjambement here shows how busy the New England community is. So it's stating there that those that lifted eyes could count because it's emphasising that actually majority of people couldn't lift their eyes. They were so focused on labour, they're only focused on survival. So it's showing that in spite of this New England community living in what is really a rural paradise, all they can do is literally survive because they are living in rural poverty. Also, there's the semantic field of nature, which really compounds the idea of the sweet scented and the breeze. So there's the five mountain ranges, a sunset, and this semantic field of nature really shows how beautiful and scenic and utopic the imagery of the Vermont area that the New England community lives in really is. However, this is in contrast to the saw itself, which snarled and rattled, snarled and rattled. And this is a repetition of the first line, snarled and rattled, and a repetition of this onomatopoeia. What this does is it shows how repetitive and monotonous and relentless the work is and also how brutally difficult this work is. Moreover, there's this sense of monotony that's compounded. We learn that nothing happened, so the workday is much the same every single day. Furthermore, here, the caesura, shows the pause of another very busy day. So the people that live in this New England community have very Puritan work ethic. They really survive and struggle hard to survive. And this is Frost's way, actually, interestingly, of dismissing notions of rural utopia. So as I mentioned, his ancestors are originally New Englanders. However, rather than depicting New England in this very nostalgic way as a rural utopia, actually, he's showing a very harsh element that probably his ancestors had to endure in rural poverty. 
Moreover, the first person pronoun I in line 10 shows an anonymous persona. We wonder who is this person? Furthermore, this is in contrast to the boy that's mentioned. So again, this goes in with Frost's way of dismissing this rural utopia. We're actually quite shocked at the child labor. So the person who's holding this all isn't even an adult. It's a young boy. And this creates pathos within us as we're reading this. Furthermore, there's work language related to him. So this young boy already knows the labor of a man and even understands the language and the jargon related to getting a half an hour of, bro of a lunch break, for instance. So this alliteration emphasizes the work language and the rest break that he gets. Rather than being a child and just indulging in his childhood, he is having to work. Furthermore, the direct speech from his sister, which says supper, and it's a minor sentence, this is what distracts the boy and it causes everything to change. Now, there's personification of this saw. So in line 15 and 16, as if to prove saws new, and then in 16, line 16, it leaped out. What this shows is just how horrible and vicious this animalistic saw really is. Furthermore, there's this interesting qualifier that's coupled with this personification. So it seemed to outsiders to leap towards the boy. So this is an important qualifier which suggests to some degree that the boy had some agency in this matter. He maybe is partly to blame for his severed hand. Furthermore, this suggestion is coupled with he must have given the hand. Now, this is a suggestion that maybe the boy offered his hand as a sacrifice to the saw. Maybe it's an attention-seeking aspect because this is the only way he's going to get any attention from his family or the wider community who just see him in terms of labour. Also, the exclamatory simple sentence, but the hand, really focuses in on his limb that's been lost. And of course, this is a fateful accident which causes the boy's life. And he swung toward them holding up the hand. And this seems almost like a cry for attention to, from the boy to his family to really look at him as a child rather than as a man. So let's carry on. Half an appeal, but half as if to keep the life from spilling. Then the boy saw all. Since he was old enough to know, big boy doing a man's work, though a child at heart, he saw all spoiled. Don't let him cut my hand off, the doctor, when he comes. Don't let him, sister. So. But the hand was gone already. The doctor put him in the dark of ether. He lay and puffed his lips out with his breath. And then the watcher at his pulse took fright. No one believed. They listened at his heart. Little, less, nothing. And that ended it. No more to build on there. And they, since they were not the one dead, turned to their affairs. So now this second half of the stanza, and do you remember it's only just one stanza or one verse, really shows that firstly the boy ends up dying. And the doctor actually interestingly plays a role in this death because he gives him ether which actually causes his heart rate to fall dangerously low. And this plays a massive part in his death, in addition of course to the severed hand and blood loss. But then whilst the New England community is really shocked and frightened at this, they turn back to their work. Of course, this shows that the poverty doesn't really allow them to do anything else. Now, here, the quote, the life from spilling is a metaphor and it emphasizes, of course, that the boy is rapidly losing blood and rapidly dying. Also, there's a bitter pun here. The boy saw all. So it's got a two-way meaning. On the one hand, he saw all. He cut everything with the saw. That could be the literal meaning. However, the other meaning behind this is that he experiences an epiphany, a realisation about his life and his poverty and what life will really be like for him for the future. Also, the alliteration big boy is a play on words. What we usually say to young children to encourage them, we say, you're a big boy, you're a big girl now. So people perhaps use that language to encourage him to carry on working and using these dangerous instruments. But also the community, whilst they speak to him in a way that we speak to children, they still treat him like an adult. And of course, this is what causes this tragedy to happen. Also, of course, there's a contrast between boy and man. So big boy doing man's work. And this contrast emphasizes he actually really shouldn't be working. He should be a child. He should be going to school. He should be enjoying himself with his friends rather than cutting and felling trees. In line 25, he saw all spoiled. And essentially what this does is it shows and emphasizes that this young boy realizes he will die. And of course, spoiled is a euphemism for uh, death. 
Furthermore, he we hear directly from the boy, there's direct speech, he's really frantic. Don't let him cut my hand off the doctor when he comes, don't let him sister. And this foreshadows how the doctor will play a role in his death. He's actually fearful of the doctor, he's supposed to be an expert. Again, this foreshadows this quotation because in this phrase, the doctor put him in the dark of ether. We actually learned that he is correct. The doctor does essentially uh, cause his death. And this is because the ether kills him as it lowers his blood pressure too much. Moreover, here in line 30, the caesura really emphasizes his death. It's a pause and essentially this causes the watcher to take fright. So the young boy has now lost his life. And the watcher, it's unclear who this is. Maybe it's his family, perhaps it's even his father who's really shocked at what's happened. However, we, we're not sure who this is. Also, the simple sentence no one believed shows that the whole community, the whole New England community, is really shocked at this untimely death of the young boy. Furthermore, the adjectives, little or less, nothing, show his diminishing heartbeat. And this is, of course, coupled with the hyphens or the caesura. And this shows how he gradually, the life, starts leaving his body. Furthermore, the caesura here before and shows that his life has now ended. And this is interesting how his life has ended. And rather than they kind of pausing and maybe reflecting on their community, we learn that they, so this is a third person pronoun, the community simply moves on. So the poem ends on a very, very sad note. They turned to their affairs and the alliteration here, turned to their, emphasises the poverty and the limited options that this New England community has. So really, it's really interesting that Frost actually depicts the New England community in a really negative way. And what this shows is that he's really dismissing this idea that the rural countryside was a rural utopia. It was like this perfect place away from the city. Actually, there was a lot of rural poverty, which he wants to emphasise and show. So that's all. If you found this useful, do make sure you visit our website www.firstratetutors.com. There you will find lots of useful revision materials for English and indeed other topics that you are studying. Thank you so much for listening.